Okay, hi everyone. I'm going to start pulling everyone up. Okay. Yes, we have Krista and Janet and of course, Ethan. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our final event in our spring conservation happy hour series. Uh, we put on these events to connect our most dedicated community, which is all of you, to some of the leading influencers in Arctic and polar bear research. We want to connect you to some of the on the ground conservation efforts that are happening. We want to bring you stories about polar bears. And we, of course, want to discuss our role in protecting the polar bears future. And uh, today we have a very, very special grand finale. Uh, plan that pretty much touches on all of those things. So before we get started with the event, though, I want to do a little bit of our classic Zoom housekeeping. I know we do actually have some new viewers with us today. So I, I just want to make sure we all know how to use the tools in the Zoom webinar platform so that you can engage and you can get your questions answered. So first of all, this is not a Zoom meeting, it's a webinar, so it's a little different in that you're, you'll only see video and hear audio from the panelists, not from other attendees. Uh, but that being said, there are some great tools to engage and to ask questions. So first and foremost, there's a chat feature that's uh, the little speech bubble icon in the bottom of your Zoom window. And please feel free to use that space informally to say, uh, hi to our panelists or let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, the world has been uh, really in a, a state of, we've been disconnected from each other for a long time. So this is a really nice opportunity for us all to connect. Uh, if you do have a formal question for any panelists, I ask that you use the Q&A feature. So that's the overlapping speech bubbles at the bottom. <laughs> And you can type and submit your question there, and then I will see that and I'll do my best to pepper those into the conversation as we go. But anything that we don't get to, we will circle back to at the end of the conversation. So we really want to make sure everyone gets their questions answered. And finally, if you're more of a verbal uh, question asker, there's an option for that. So uh, you can raise your hand in Zoom and that will signal to me that you would like me to unmute you and ask your question verbally. I'll probably save any of those for the end of the presentation, uh, but please feel free to do that. Um, that's definitely an option that we'd like you to use. So the, that's all we really need to go over in terms of uh, the Zoom features. And um, as I mentioned, today is a very, very special event. So I'm actually going to pass it to our executive director, Krista Wright, to kick us off and to introduce our honored guests. So Krista, over to you. Well, thank you everyone for being here and a special thank you to Ian for joining us. Um, as Emily said, or the saying goes, we saved the best for last. And this is definitely true um, since you'll be hearing from Ian because there is probably no one um, who has seen more wild polar bears. I don't know if this is true, Ian, but I said this to our team. I said between the years, um, over 55 years in the field and spending countless summers on boats in the Arctic, Ian Sterling has probably seen more wild polar bears than any one person. So um, beyond all of those years studying in the field and the 300 peer reviewed papers plus and the five books on polar bears, we know Ian as um, not, not only an expert in polar bears, but also as a mentor to the Organization of Polar Bears International. And I think, um, truth be told, amongst all of his um, awards, and, there, and they are many, um, he's an appointed officer in the Order of Canada, and an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. We've given him a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, the Society of Marine Mammals has given him a Lifetime Achievement Award. But despite all, I mean, and those are very big awards and he's contributed so much to polar bears, but for PBI, he's really been an, a mentor, not only to the organization, but to many of our staff, um, both our research staff and people like myself. And I truly don't believe that we would be where we are today without the support of Ian over the years, um, because it's uh, he really helped us to arrive to where we are today. 
as an organization that <laughs> is a, a known resource um, about polar bears and polar bear conservation. And Ian has contributed to that in a, in a huge way um, outside of all of his other um, accomplishments. So I, I truly mean that we saved the best for last. And I hope a lot of you ask questions throughout the presentation and that you enjoy Ian as much as we do because um, he is a wealth of knowledge. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Emily. Thank you, Ian. And um, we'll get started. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're gonna make you blush just a little more, Ian. And before we begin our conversation, we are going to share a video that PBI produced a couple of years ago about Dr. Ian Sterling and his work. So many of you on the call will be familiar with Ian's work, but for those of you that are not, we wanted to offer a little bit of background and additional context so that we can build off of that for the following Q&A. So I'm gonna pull that up right now. <coughs> Give me just a brief moment. Okay. People ask, why is it so important to study polar bears and Arctic and climate change? And I think an important thing is that it's not just about the polar bear, but they're <coughs> a bellwether, they're an indicator. And if polar bears are in trouble, then it means that something's happening further down the ecosystem. The animals at the top, like the seals or the bears, are being affected, then something big is happening. People around the whole world are really interested in polar bears. They value them. They want to know that they're in an environment that is continuing. Well, my name is Ian Sterling, and I've been working in polar regions, north and south, for about 46 years. I was always just interested in the outdoors. I grew up in a small mining town in, in the mountains in southeastern BC. I always loved the outdoors. It's not like being a bank teller or a cashier in a grocery store. When you either get to the end, you're, you're maybe quite glad about it, and you want to do something else. Science and, and Arctic or polar biology has just been my life. Uh, the most informative aspect of all was uh, being at a couple of camps up in the high Arctic and Devon Island. We spent a great deal of time for several years just with telescopes watching bears uh, be bears. Being able to watch undisturbed bears for weeks on end in 24 hour daylight, that type of work was absolutely the highlight for me. The first time I came to uh, Churchill was in August of <coughs> in, uh, 1970. But in, those were what you might call the good old days now. All the bears were fat. What I was really interested in was long-term natural environmental fluctuations and how those would influence how you would manage or conserve polar bears. Climate warming wasn't even on the radar then. For the passage of time, we've started to see that things are changing a great deal. We became aware of climate warming. We've looked at the rate of ice breakup. As breakup gets earlier and earlier, what that's doing is shortening the bear's feeding time at the absolute most important time of the year. So they're coming ashore in progressively lighter stages, poorer body condition. As a result of climate warming, uh, we're seeing very strong negative signs now on the health of bears in Western Hudson Bay. And this is a harbinger or a a beacon that's telling us what's going to happen in a lot of other areas if climate warming isn't stopped or brought under control. The way things are looking at the moment, it's quite likely that there won't be very many bears here in western Hudson Bay in 40 years. we really started to work globally to do something, we might be able to slow things down and conserve <coughs> some of the most important areas of Arctic habitat.
Okay. Ian, thank you very much for letting us uh, share that to kick things off and kind of um, paint a picture of your career and your life's work in polar regions with a, a broad brush. And uh, now would love to talk to you a little bit more. I actually already see we have some questions in the Q and A, but I might just uh, start out. I would love it if you could tell us how you got started in polar research. And I do have the <laughs> photos provided for me, so I will pull those up and start sharing them momentarily. Okay, thanks very much, Leslie. I'll also apologize. I may cough once or twice or have a drink of uh, water or whatever. I, I seem to be having some kind of allergic reaction to leaves and everything else in the spring. So otherwise, uh, uh, we can just go ahead from there. Were you going to show the slides or are they in the background or shall I just talk to you? Or what? <laughs> the, uh, about 55 years ago, I started my polar work in Antarctica, really. I wanted to do work in the Canadian Arctic and there were virtually no, uh, uh, nothing available. So it was easier to go to the Antarctic and join the New Zealand Antarctic program and work on Weddell seals. You can see some off in the distance there. <clears throat> and the next uh, picture is uh, relates to one of the things that was very formative to me in, uh, in polar bear work in, in back in Canada a number of years later. There's a huge amount of variability in the reproduction and survival of young, uh, young seals, depending on uh, fluctuations in the, in the environment, what was going on things that are beyond your control. And it really gave, gave me the, brought, brought it home to me that just uh, uh, going out and doing quick studies or whatever is not gonna tell you because there's a certain amount of uh, long-term fluctuation going on that's very, very important. So when I came back to Canada, the Weddell seals there are the ecological equivalent in the Antarctic of the uh, <clears throat> ring seals in the Arctic. We came back to Canada and there were three major or two major things that I was uh, supposed to do. <clears throat> One was to look at uh, population structures of uh, numbers of polar bears so that we could estimate the size of uh, polar bear harvest for sustainable uh, harvesting for the uh, for Inuit. And the other, <clears throat> the other thing was uh, uh, to be doing environmental assessment work. There was at that time <clears throat> in the early 70s when I was really getting going <clears throat> in Canada. There was uh, quite a lot of offshore exploration going on and we were supposed to uh, be uh, getting, a, getting a certain amount of baseline information and trying to assess what the possible negative effects of, of all of that uh, uh, was. And one of the things that came became very clear to me uh, very early on was that uh, you couldn't really function really well in either of those two major objection or uh, uh, objectives without a lot more basic information about the bears, what they did out in the sea ice, how they interacted each other with each other, <clears throat> and how they interacted in particular with the seals. I don't know if you can move on with these or not, Leslie. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> we'll see where we get to. <clears throat> So I started doing a work in a number of areas. And one of the most important was at Radstock Bay, which was referred to in the, uh, in the film. And that uh, place there is Caswell Tower. And we have a little cabin right on the very top. And you can sit in there or out, outside on a nice day and uh, watch the bears uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, there's a nice day in the, uh, <clears throat> in the springtime or in the early summer. And the bears are all out there. And the uh, next one is uh, a picture of the uh, of uh, camp in the other place and uh, the other other point that we had, Cape, Cape Lydon, in the wintertime. And it would be 20, 30 below uh, during the uh, springtime work. And we just parked ourselves outside in the tent when you were ready to sleep. You warmed up your sleeping bag in the upper bunk and then uh, threw it in the uh, tent and got in before it cooled off. Uh, but the, the long-term work uh, from those sorts of things gave us insight into what the bears actually do when they're out on the sea ice. And I'd done a lot of tracking, and, and, uh, but watching the bears themselves, see what they do when they make different kinds of tracks, taught me more about the bears than almost anything else. And when I'm uh, talking to students, what I would usually refer to it as uh, uh, letting the bears tell you about themselves rather than you telling the bears about themselves. <clears throat> Want to go on to the next one? The, uh, so you can see then the map on the uh, right-hand side there. 
we had two camps, one uh, Caswell Tower, which is in the picture there, <clears throat> we used mainly in late spring or summer, and the one out in Cape Lydon, which was the winter picture, and we used that uh, in the spring when they, <clears throat> when they, ice was all formed up because most of the good uh, seal habitat was further out right around the mouth of the bay. Okay, next. The, uh, we learned a lot in particular <coughs> about how bears hunt and how they teach their young ones. This was really important because at that time in the early to mid seventies in, uh, in, in Northwest Territories, which was what all of the Canadian Arctic was before they created uh, Nunavut in 1999, and the mother polar bears were only protected until their cubs turned into yearlings and then they could be shot. And I was try pushed hard to try and get that changed because I said, look, uh, if, if the polar bears are keeping their cubs for two and a half years before they let them go, that's because they need to do it. And those females should be protected. Otherwise, you're basically you're killing all of the whole litter. And I was challenged on that. And they said, uh, next, please. And they said, uh, well, where's your data? And so I said, well, we're going to go out and get some data. And we went to Caswell Tower and Radstock Bay. We did a lot of uh, work and we did uh, a lot of observation. And we found, uh, in fact, that that the uh, the yearling polar bears did almost no hunting at all. The bomb not weren't much different from the cubs of the year. It was clear that if, uh, if, if they were turned on their, on their own at one and a half years, they were going to be gone. So I went back with my data and the following year they changed the regulations, which I was quite pleased about. Well, the ring seals have their birth layers in drift, drift ice underneath the uh, drifted snow on top of the, of the ice. And here there was a birth layer and a female uh, a bear had come along and dug, dug in there to try to catch the, uh, the cub or the, or the pup or, or maybe even the mother if they're really lucky. They didn't get anything there. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know if a kill was made because the snow is all red. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> so we uh, have uh, spent a lot of time watching all these uh, these years of about, about uh, for three years, we watched a great number of family groups, got the regulations changed uh, for that. Next, please. The other, the other really important thing we learned a lot about, and this was working with a, a wonderful uh, Anuvi Alawit fellow on the right hand side who's uh, passed on now. And this is a snow drift that uh, has a birth layer underneath it. And we, we developed some techniques for uh, looking at, uh, at these layers, figuring out densities in different habitats. And then sadly learned a little bit about what happens when the climate warms. Next, please. This is a birth layer, uh, used to be a birth layer in southeastern Baffin Island. This was in the spring when normally it would be 20 or 25 below zero uh, centigrade. And uh, the, we got some very unwarm seasonal weather that started coming in every uh, few months or in every couple of years. And w one time when I was there, it rained for about three days steady in two big uh, fjords. We went out <clears throat> and every birth layer in the whole area was washed out and collapsed like this. And you can see the dead seal pup uh, lying out there. That one died of exposure. But the bears and the foxes within two days had killed the whole works. And uh, people have said to me, well, wasn't that a good thing? They got something to eat. And uh, my response to that is no, it was not a good thing because when the newborn seals are like that, they've got no fat on them. They're not worth anything. Uh, and they need to, sp to spend six weeks before they're weaned. And at that point, they're 50% fat by wet weight. That's what the bears really need. So one of the consequences of uh, climate warming in the spring is not just that the ice is breaking up earlier, so the bears have less time on the platform they need to be hunting them. But in a lot of cases, the habitat, is, the birth layer habitat that's producing their food is already gone and the negative effects are coming on on the, uh, on the pups. I think that's the end of the, uh, the slides there, Leslie. Yeah. So that's sort of, uh, sort of a little bit of an intro into uh, some of where we, uh, where we wanted to go. So if uh, Jan or uh, Leslie, if you or any of the uh, participants want to ask any questions, that's just fine. Yeah, I have a few, um, a few more questions for you actually, and then we will pepper in some from the participants. So um, that was very helpful to kind of hear how you started your career looking at the broader relationship between ice dependent species and their ecosystem. 
And what was your, you've done a lot of work in Western Hudson Bay. What was your first inkling that something was going on with the Western Hudson Bay polar bear population that might, that might be linked and that there might be a link between body condition and climate warming? Well, this uh, goes back to the second picture of all those Weddell seal pups and, uh, and the, the great fluctuations that were happening for natural reasons. <clears throat> when I went in the uh, Beaufort Sea, we very quickly found that every now, about every, uh, every few years, there was a big reproductive failure and that was causing uh, the bears, uh, cubs to die, the females not to get pregnant and so on. So it was a really big event. It made me realize the one thing we needed to do was maintain some long-term work on uh, polar bear population somewhere. The one in Western Hudson Bay is accessible and is most cost-effective to work on because the ice all melts in the summertime, so the whole population is on land. It's easy to find lots of bears because they're white on a dark background. And uh, then, so we started monitoring. What we were looking at, looking for, was to get some insights into the uh, cause or the what mean what long-term fluctuations mean for the bears. We we were not looking at uh, polar or climate warming or even thinking about it. But when you look at a long-term uh, database from uh, polar bears on populations, you realize that if you only had, even if you only had uh, 10 years of data, that wouldn't be long enough to, to detect long-term trends underneath because uh, there's so much interannual fluctuation. But by the time we got to 1999, <clears throat> we had over 20 years of data and we could see the natural fluctuations going on but under that, we could also see a very, a very strong and steady other influence, which we, when we analyzed the data and really looked at it quite clearly, Western Hudson Bay was telling us for the very first time, for sure, that climate warming was affecting ice and that was having a negative effect on the, on the polar bears, partly because it removed the platform for them to hunt bears at the most important time of the year. But the other side, which we wouldn't have gotten without the in-depth field work, is the consequence of climate warming on the habitat of ring seals, which the bears depend on. Mm -hmm. And you, so you talk of that long-term data set and the importance of that. Can you give me a sense for how many, you know, how many people end up contributing to a long-term data set? How is something like that acquired? Well, it's very hard to do because uh, fund, funding for long-term work is, uh, is expensive. You don't get, um, you don't, it's not flash in the pan, you get something spectacular <clears throat> every year or two. Uh, but it's what you have to do if you want to know what's going on in, uh, in, in any kind of a population, whether it's seabirds or cod or, or um, uh, whales or polar bears, you need that long term because the, the environment fluctuates so much and <clears throat> everybody uh, watching or listening wherever they live in the, live in the world, perfectly aware that some years are much warmer than others, uh, stormier than others, colder than others, and so on. And th that same is true of, of, uh, of course, of the Arctic. And in some cases, maybe a little bit more true because climate warming is happening about twice as fast up there as it is in most of the rest of the world. So uh, long-term is really important. So what I did <clears throat> was I designed a whole number of shorter term projects that we could do along the way that in the meantime, that uh, provided us with the baseline information for monitoring as well. Great, thank you. And can you give me a sense, what changes have you seen in sea ice and polar bears over the course of your career? Well, the main thing is just that the, the breakup is a lot earlier in a lot of places like Western Hudson Bay and you get up in the Beaufort Sea or around Svalbard. And now you have vast areas of open water uh, in the winter time. And, uh, and 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 in some areas aren't even freezing in the in the in the winter to to much uh, much extent. So that all that habitat that the bears are depending on, and it's not just it's not just the bears. It's the seals as well. It is, you, I keep on hearing all these uh, expressions that uh, the bears are losing their ice and they need their ice back. Well, they need more than the ice back. They don't just need the ice for walking around on. They need it for the seals that live underneath it have their breathing holes, have birth layers under the snow, and they need those ring seals because they are the prime food of polar bears throughout their range. And uh, so that, that's basically the, the changes in ice and the effects of that on the polar bears is what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. 
And you've obviously explored so many questions over the course of your career, so many different research questions. Uh, what do you consider to be the next generation of questions in Arctic conservation? Well, to a large degree, I don't think a lot of what we want to do in the future is all that different than what we've been trying to do in the past, but we're getting some better tools. Uh, satellite telemetry uh, and, and satellite uh, imagery for on, on ice. Some of the ways of tracking bears, uh, I know Polar Bears International has been working with the development of a of a new little uh, glue-on radio that might be helpful for tracking adult males because we can't uh, can't track adult males because their necks are too big and his collars won't stay on. So I think that the myself, I don't think the 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 uh, objectives are that different. We really need to continue to work on uh, what the how the bears are making a living in their particular environment because there's 19 different populations. The habitats are quite different and the ecological circumstances vary a bit. So although we can take a lot of what we've learned in Hudson Bay and apply it to a lot of other areas, you can't just do a one-to-one -one fit. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a lot of questions coming in through the Q&A. So I'm actually going to pepper a few of these in right now because they're a nice fit. So um, first, I'm going to share a question from um, Robert and Carolyn Buchanan, who I believe you might know. Uh, what do you see or what do you project for the population to be of polar bears to look like over the next 30 years? And they also said, Ian, thank you so much, all caps, for your dedication. Thank you very much. I think that uh, uh, my, originally I was thinking of a 30 year horizon. I'm thinking more like 40 or, or a bit, bit more. I think in places like Western Hudson Bay, which are uh, right down in the southern end of their uh, <clears throat> of their range, or maybe Southern Hudson Bay as well, I think there's not going to be a lot doing uh, for polar bears in in the next 40 years or so, if the trends are anything anything like what are being predicted. What I'm hoping, I think the the thing that I think is is most hopeful and uh, is that. A number of a number of countries in the U.S. has uh, joined the club again on the importance of uh, of climate warming. That if we're able to slow things down, I don't know if we'll be able to stop them in the foreseeable future. I kind of doubt it. I think that things are liable to get a little bit worse before they get better. But I think that the world as a whole is now seeing uh, the effects of climate warming, and so I think that that, along with the technology and things that are developing, gives me some hope that um, we will make some progress over the longer term, but I'm not, I'm not uh, expecting it to happen anytime soon. Yes, it's a uh, global lift can, can take a few decades. <laughs> um, I have a question here from Georgie. Is there any research being done on populations of ring seals and whether their geographic ranges are altered due to lesser sea ice extent? There has been a certain amount of work uh, done on ring seals, in my opinion, because I come from a background as a seal biologist initially and uh, probably done as much work on seals as I have on bears, but they're not as charismatic, so you don't hear about it as much. <clears throat> but uh, there has been some long-term work, some very good work done in uh, on ring seals by a fellow named Dr. Tom Smith and a former student of mine, uh, Lois Harwood, who worked with the uh, Nuvialowit for 40 years. Uh, in uh, in the Beaufort Sea, and there's been some work over in Alaska. So there is uh, there is some long-term work going on. I don't think myself it's anywhere near enough, and I think it needs to be a lot more focused on uh, on effects of climate, on the pup production and the survival of, of pups as, as uh, things are changing. And one step further down in the ecosystem, I think the, the changes that are going on in the sea ice from some of the preliminary things I've seen uh, are that they're affecting the uh, species composition of the of the small fish that live under the ice that the seals live on, and also the invertebrates. There are a lot of things happening there very rapidly, and uh, I don't think we know anywhere near enough about it. Yes, that's a great flag. We do obviously talk about polar bears a lot. They are very charismatic, but the entire ecosystem uh, needs to be observed and understood. I have another great question from Jane. What is the polar bear source of hydration? The most most of the water that polar bears get, they get from uh, eating snow 
or, uh, or uh, a little bit, that's only a small, small amount of the water. Most of the water they get is from the fat that they store on their body and metabolically they turn that fat into water. And when you think about it, that's directly related to energy conservation, which is good for all of us to be thinking about in terms of polar bears. But uh, <clears throat> when you think about it, uh, if a bear is thirsty and it's 30 below and he's walking around in the Arctic, where is he going to get some water? Well, from, from the snow. You think of the amount of energy that it takes to melt snow, it takes a whole lot less energy to convert some fat into water. So they walk around and, you know, I've watched bears, I watch it for a month at a month at a time, and I don't see a single bear even eat, eating a bit of snow sometimes. Hmm. That was a great question, Jane. I actually wondered the same thing. So thank you very much, Ian. Uh, I might pop back to one of my questions and then um, I'll come back to our Q&A. Uh, but I'm wondering what, uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us, Ian, what accomplishments are you most proud of throughout the course of your career? Well, as I told you once before, I, I'm not really all that excited about talking about me. <clears throat> but, <No. laughs> and when, you, when you've had, uh, had a, a life as fortunate as I have for the last uh, quite a few decades, I think the thing that's most important to me is the, <clears throat> is the long-term accumulation of all of it and the in-depth insights that's given me between the bears, the seals, the ice, and the evolution of, uh, of ice breeding seals in the Arctic with terrestrial uh, uh, predators, and the seals in the Antarctic with the marine predators, leopard seals and, and killer whales. Within that envelope, I think uh, the work at Radstock Bay that we talked about at the beginning, where we uh, <coughs> got out of our helicopters and stopped drugging bears and chasing them and, and uh, following them around with satellite radios and watch the bears and let them tell us about how they lived and what, what's important to them was I think the highlight, uh, personal highlight. There wasn't a single one because we've been uh, doing that over, over a period, uh, started the first work out there in 1973 and the last was 1999. So there's been quite a bit of it. Yes. Uh, can you share any memorable polar bear observations from your time in Radstock Bay? Well, like I say, I mean, where do you start with something like every day you see something you haven't quite seen before? And uh, <clears throat> I like uh, <coughs> sort of thing that people uh, always ask me, do I, I see the mothers teaching their cubs? <coughs> and yeah, I do. In that picture with the, uh, with the bear uh, just about to pound, I saw a minute ago, just about to pound through the ice. Uh, she, her little cubs are sitting there, that's it, sitting, she's trained them and they learn really fast. Parrot polar bears are very, very smart. And uh, she's taught them that they can't move while she's hunting because the tiniest amount of sound goes through the ice and the seals uh, and di disappear immediately. And I've, I've, with my hydrophone, I've listened under the ice and tried to just move the heel of my of my boot, the tiniest amount, and it comes through like a floghorn or, or, or a gunshot. And see, those cubs are absolutely sitting and when she's walking along, she's going along and she thinks she sees something, she just freezes, doesn't move. And those cubs, they recognize her just like a really trained retriever, the cubs just instantly sit down and they don't move until she uh, has caught something or move, or she starts to walk on, they, they learn that, 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 that it's okay for them to move. And you see them starting to do the same sort of thing as they get a little, and a little bit older uh, of sitting and watching and they learn how to break in. And one of the reasons that they probably have to live to two and a half to three years before they can go on their own is they're simply not big enough to be able to pound down through the, the windblown snow uh, are there. So watching the females teach the cubs and the cubs uh, learning is besides being uh, just wonderful to watch in its own right is really, uh, I guess I guess that would be as, uh, as much of a highlight as anything. Yes, that's a highlight for me just hearing about it. So I can only imagine seeing it. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you. And uh, Ralph and I actually have, oh, sorry, Ralph, we'll get to your question in one minute. An anonymous asker and I actually have the same question. I'm wondering what gives you hope for the future of polar bears? We obviously hear a lot of really bleak news. Um, the challenges that polar bears face are, are 
fairly enormous. Where do you find hope in this work? Well, I'm <clears throat> I'm afraid uh, to for whatever it's worth. I'm a little bit of a a little bit of a uh, <clears throat> congenital optimist. I find it really hard to imagine that humans could put can put people on the moon and solve uh, great pandemics and all manner of sorts of things, and could still be so stupid as to see that we're destroying the world uh, as we know it through climate warming. So, I, though I think it's probably going to take a while for uh, people to start acting adequately, uh, collectively. <clears throat> so I think they're probably going to eventually recognize that if they don't, there's gonna be really serious problems. So I guess being an optimist, I think that humans will eventually smarten up. They're slow learners sometimes, and this is a very, very clear example of that. I don't know how much more data you, you need <coughs> to know what we're doing to the uh, to the world as a whole in the Arctic and in particular in this case. So I, I guess my long term view is I, I, I think that we will come uh, come around and hopefully in time to save a, a certain amount of the polar bear habitat, maybe in the very long period of time to cool things down enough that we might even recover some, but uh, I think we better concentrate on trying to concentrate, trying to save some of what's left before we start worrying about rebuilding. Mm -hmm. And a bit of a specific question in that vein, this is from Jeff. Jeff says, I believe the Canadian government has recently indicated, sorry, if you could hear that background noise, has recently indicated they are setting aside a large protected area in hope of creating a future protected area for polar bears. Are you aware of this, Dr. Sterling? And if so, are you optimistic about such initiatives? Um, well, I'm not 100% clear about what area you're talking. Are you talking about the protected area, what they call the last ice area in the northern end of the Canadian Arctic Islands and Greenland? Or are you talking about the Denning area in Alaska or what? Uh, that's a great question. Unfortunately, Jeff can't tell us right now. Uh, you can follow up, Jeff, if you want to in the Q&A, but why don't we just answer a little more generally. Are you, are you optimistic about the idea of setting aside protected areas for polar bears in general? Is that, a, uh, is that an effective communication or conservation measure? I, th I think it is, but it has to be done intelligently as well. And there's a, a probably a, a scale of, of, uh, of uh, things that we should be doing. Uh, 20 years ago, I, was, I said we should, be, we should be starting some baseline work in what now is called the, uh, the last ice area, uh, the area that the guy, ice modelers say is they're gonna be the last one to lose ice. That's in the Northern Canadian Arctic Islands and Northern Greenland. There's some work uh, just beginning now I think protecting an area up there is absolutely vital. <clears throat> There's another large protected area uh, in Lancaster Sound uh, off of Baffin Bay. I think that's a, that's a very good area as well. There's also the proposed, uh, or the, the Arctic wildlife area has been proposed to preserve for a number of species, uh, including polar bears, because it's got uh, the uh, most, uh, most of the polar bear pupping habitat or uh, denning habitat that polar bears have for the live in uh, northern Alaska. The worry I have about that one is the ice is disappearing so much in the southern Beaufort Sea. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure how long the bears are even going to be able to get to Alaska to uh, to den. They probably probably will for um, uh, another 20 or, or years or so. I don't that's a, that's just a number off the top of my head. But I think uh, just in general when you're thinking about trying to uh, set aside uh, an area, you better sort of do a lot of work on uh, climate and ice modeling uh, and, and see where the last uh, remnants of, of the habitat they need are going to be and build from there. Hmm. That's really helpful, thank you. And that was a great question, Jeff. Uh, feel free to follow up if, um, if we didn't answer the question you were, trying, you were asking. Uh, Ralph has a question. This is a little bit more uh, general for PBI. How can my high school students become involved in Polar Bears International? Will there be events tutored uh, towards high school students? And fortunately, Ralph, I have great news. We do have uh, live events and live programming for students. Uh, we have wrapped up, we do it seasonally. We have a program called Tundra Connections 
uh, in the spring and in the fall. And then um, we sprinkle in other live events throughout the year. Uh, so we can definitely follow up with you and kind of give you the, the arc of that calendar so you can put it on, um, on your calendar. And we would love to uh, participate with you and connect with your students. That would be great. I'd like to add to that <clears throat> for any, <clears throat> any students that, are, <clears throat> that might be uh, out there or parents of students that are interested in these sort of things. I think the, the website for Polar Bears International is really, uh, is really very informative. It has a regular series of, uh, of articles, of uh, <clears throat> videos, tremendous source of information if you're interested. Then the, they're also uh, in the Tundra Connections program in Churchill in the fall. They have uh, live programs with all sorts of people and you see the bears out the, out the window uh, doing their thing just uh, undisturbed. Uh, I, I would say just uh, checking into the PBI website on a regular basis would be a really great way to start uh, being informed about bears. And they also have a question session there, so a uh, section. So if there's a question that you would like to specifically uh, know something about, put it on the question uh, board and uh, they'll find someone who can uh, give you, uh, if not the complete answer, as much as we might know about that particular issue, because you have to remember there's an awful lot of things we don't know. Thank you, Ian. You're hired as our new Tundra Connection spokesperson. <laughs> oh, I think I'm a big fan of Tundra Connections. I think that's one of the uh, one of the biggest and nicest things that BBI does. Yes, agreed. That's definitely uh, one of my favorite programs. Uh, we have a question from Christopher. Could you speak to the role PBI has played in your research? In my research. <coughs> uh, well, I've, I've actually, <clears throat> until very recently, I have uh, not uh, not sought direct support from PBI because I thought of a lot of what they were doing and some of the other people they were supporting maybe needed more help than I did. Uh, in the last year or so, I have uh, gotten a small grant from PBI because I wanted to finish up, uh, I'm still working on it, I want to finish up some of the work that we did at Radstock Bay. And we had such an enormous data set, I simply couldn't get through it all on my own. So I got a bit of money from PBI and I rehired a woman that has worked for me off and on for about 40 years, who's worked at Radstock Bay. She knows the data, so she tabulates the stuff for me. <clears throat> and then I've, I have an, uh, a statistician on loan from the department that I don't have to pay anything for. With, for. And I have two other polar bear scientists participating in the analysis of the data and writing. So my actual, the money that PBI is giving me is actually fairly small, but it's a, it's a seed money and it's providing the catalyst to all of the, for all of the rest of it to come together and happen. So the, that's a relatively uh, recent thing. Other than that, I think uh, what PBI has done in general to support uh, people like me and uh, anybody who's doing polar bear work is increasing the interest in the public and large and especially in younger people about polar bears, about Arctic uh, ecology, the threat of climate change. Climate change is not so much something to be afraid of as something to understand and realize that we, we have to do something about it. And I think a lot of the educational material that PBI presents like that gets people interested and uh, then they may or may be interested in supporting things whether it's just by following things or otherwise as is irrelevant if they're interested then that's something positive that pbi is is contributing hmm. that's one of my new favorite quotes ian climate change isn't something to be afraid of but something to understand <laughs> well you're right on well that was all you <laughs> um we just have Okay, let's see here. Sorry, I lost my, uh, I had one question that I wanted to uh, run by you. So you've obviously worked in the field researching polar bears a lot. And I know that you've also traveled the world observing polar bears on, on various trips and, um, and participating as a guide. And I wonder if you have any uh, memorable sightings from those. I'm sure you have many memorable sightings, but are there any memorable sightings that you might be willing to share with us from, from some of your travels? 
Well, it's like I say, it's hard, it's hard to pick a hard to pick a, um, a, a jewel out of a bucket of them. But uh, uh, the one of the one of the reasons that I started guiding <clears throat> was that uh, so many really important things that are affecting polar bears are happening in the pack ice in the summer. And the bears are distributed widely distributed at low densities. It would be prohibitively expensive to try and hire a ship to drive around just to study them. You'd hardly, you'd, but the amount of sight, sightings you would get, they'd be hugely uh, expensive. You just not worth it. I figured the only way that I could do that is I would uh, go get a job as a guide and a lecturer on uh, on some polar e ecotourism uh, trips. And I worked uh, for a number of different companies and a number of different ships, <clears throat> uh, steadily trying to upgrade the quality of the places that they were going. So I only took trips that would take me to places that would have the habitat at the time of the year I was interested in. And so I, I watched a lot of stuff uh, to do with a, what I call aquatic stalking when the bears are, <clears throat> are in the water and they're swimming under, underneath the ice. And you can see there, for example, that bear standing there. Maybe there was a, be a seal further up on the, along the edge of the uh, along the edge of the ice up to the left of your screen. <clears throat> that bear might slide into the water dive go slip under one and they don't dive they don't dive like that when they're hunting they drift backwards and they sift just out of the air and the nose just goes down quietly and then if they need a breath they don't come up and have gasp like a whale or whatever they come up and just the nose comes out of the water and they breathe carefully and they go down again like that and seeing how that is one of the major ways that they hunt in the uh in the pack ice in the open water season was a really uh, neat eye opener. It also made it clear why, why hunting in that situation, what pays off for them is hunting bearded seals, which may be 10, 20, 30 times the amount of fat on them than a young, beard, young ring seal. But for whatever reason, they're not quite as nervous as the, uh, as the ring seals are. So not always, but sometimes they can get a little bit closer. And I've watched with one bear that swam underwater in a single stretch for over three minutes and came up right in front of the, 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 the seal and uh, whap, that was, that was it. But you know, that's the sort of thing you could be out there for years and never see that. So, so I spent 13 seasons, parts of 13 seasons doing that. And the other thing I saw, which was really interesting, which gave me a little bit of ecological insight into the seal part of it, people said, well, well there's harp seals are really abundant and they're growing in numbers and they're all over the place. And you see them up in Svalbard, but they, they never haul out on the ice, almost never rather. Uh, and so the bears can't catch them in the open water. So that might not much help, but Every now and then, for reasons that we don't really understand, you'll maybe get a couple of hundred or a thousand ring seals, I mean, beard, harp seals, hauled out on the ice. And when a pair, bear's lucky enough to be there, it can virtually walk almost from seal to seal, killing them serially. And the seals aren't sufficient, how they haven't evolved predator escape response sufficiently to run away immediately. So it's getting some insights like that into exactly how the bears relate to different species of seals that they that they that they prey on and depend on for survival. Those are insights that you can't get without actually going to that kind of habitat. So that that was kind of the peak uh, peak of learning for me for the uh, for the working as a guide. Yes, well, that was a, a very creative solution. I can imagine that you could float around on a boat for a long time and not see that. So it's great to hear some of those special sightings that you were able to witness. And um, I think we've actually answered all of our questions here. So unless anyone has a final question to, uh, to shuttle in, then we might start to wrap up this event. Ian, I can't thank you enough for spending this time with us. I know it's such a treat for all of us at PBI and it's such a treat for all of our attendees. You just have such a wealth of knowledge and stories and interesting anecdotes and really offer a, a unique perspective to all of us on the world of the polar bear and its ecosystem. So thank you so much for being here. Well, yeah. thank you, Emily. That's uh, that's kind of the, you and Krista to, to let me uh, come out and tell stories. And I sort of started guiding. One of my kids said to me, "Well, uh, this must be a really good job for you because people actually want to hear your stories." And 
But I would say, and first, thanks for concerned. I think they got it the wrong way around. I think uh, the, the really big thank you goes from me to PBI for everything that you do as an organization to, uh, in particular, uh, public education. You support a lot of really good science as well. But, um, you know, when it really comes down to it, it's going to be the public at large that's going to determine whether things really happen. And uh, so I think that the you're addressing that group. You're using the science, a lot of the science that you that you support as well, <coughs> as part of that. But uh, the the big thing that I, I I say thank you for is what you're is what you're contributing uh, more than anything else. Well, thank you so much. We are very lucky to have you as our friend and advisor. Um, I yeah I remember when I first started wa working for PBI eight years ago you were one of the first people I heard about so uh, you're certainly a focal point for all of us and I think I'm going to pass it now to Janet this is our last event of the season so I'm going to let Janet close us out yeah I just wanted to also thank Dr. Sterling for joining us here tonight it was really a pleasure to get to hear from you I haven't had the opportunity to meet you in person yet but I hope that we do get to cross paths um, sometime in the future and um, since this is our last uh, event for the spring I just wanted to thank everyone for continuing to support this event um, I hope that you found the discussions helpful in understanding how your support is helping influence this critical work in the Arctic. Um, I know it's been a lot of fun for us and it's been really great to get to, to know some of you outside of the happy hours as well. Um, the happy hours were developed with you in mind. So we're always happy to hear from you and what you would like to see and um, hear from us in the future at these events. So please don't hesitate to contact me at fundraising at pbears.org. If you have thoughts, ideas, or suggestions for future events or how we might be able to improve our time together, um, we'd love to hear from you. And um, I hope everyone, with that, I hope everyone has a great summer and we'll be reaching out again in the fall uh, to announce the next round of happy hours. So please keep an eye out on your email inbox um, for those invitations. And in the meantime, I hope you guys will stay in touch throughout the summer. Uh, it's always wonderful to hear from you. Yes, be well. Oh, go ahead, Krista. <laughs> I was just gonna ditto what Janet said. And, and thanks Ian for um, sharing your time with us today. We're especially appreciative of all the time that you've dedicated over the years to our endeavors, <laughs> which have been many. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you all. We hope you have a good evening or time of day wherever you are, people are tuning in from all over. So um, we look forward to seeing you next fall. And as Janet said, please reach out. And until then, uh, be well. And we're very grateful for all of you. We'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.